it has been manifestly declared to you that no one can fulfill the law of God, and therefore by the law all are condemned. It follows necessarily, therefore, that some other thing should be required for our salvation than the law, and that is a true and living faith in Christ, bringing forth good works and a life according to God's commandments. And you have heard the ancient author's opinion of this saying, faith in Christ alone justifies a person, so plainly declared. So you see that the very true meaning of this proposition or saying we are justified only by faith in Christ, according to the meaning of the old ancient authors, is this. We put our faith in Christ, that we are justified by him alone, that we are justified by God's free mercy and the merits of our Saviour Christ alone. By no virtue or good works of our own that are in us, or what we are able to, to have or to do, can we deserve the same. Christ himself is the only meritorious cause of our justification. Here you perceive many words are used to avoid contention in words with those who delight to brawl about words, and also to show the true meaning, to avoid evil talking and misunderstanding. And yet it is possible that all of this will not satisfy those who are contentious. Such people will always invent things to contend about, even when they have no reason to do so. We are more concerned with those, however, who are more desirous to know the truth and to profit by it than we are with those who, when it's plain enough, want to contend about it and with contentious and critical complaining to obscure and darken it. It is true that our own works do not justify us to speak properly of our justification. That is to say, our works do not merit or deserve cancellation of our sins and make we who were unrighteous righteous before God. But God, of his own mercy, justifies us through the merits of his son, Jesus Christ, not because we deserve it, but because he does. Nevertheless, faith directly sends us to Christ for cancellation of our sins, and that by faith, given to us by God, so that we embrace the promise of God's mercy and of the forgiveness of our sins. None of our other virtues or works can properly do this. Therefore, Scripture says that faith without works justifies. Since it's the same thing in effect to say faith without works and only faith justifies us, the old ancient fathers of the church from time to time spoke of our justification in this way. Only faith justifies us, meaning nothing else than what St Paul meant when he said that faith without works justifies us. And because all of this is brought to pass only through the merit and worthiness of our Saviour Christ, and not through our merits or through the merit of any virtue that we have within us, or of any work that comes from us. Therefore, in respect of merit and deserving, we forsake faith, works and other virtues. For our own imperfection is so great through the corruption of original sin that everything within us is imperfect. Faith, charity, hope, dread, thoughts, words and works, and therefore not able to merit or deserve any part of our justification for us. And we speak in this way, humbling ourselves to God to give all the glory to our Saviour Christ, who is best worthy to have it. You've heard about the role of God in our justification and how we receive it from him freely, by his mercy, without deserving it, through true 
and lively faith. Now you shall hear the role and duty of a Christian to God, what we on our part ought to render back to God for his great mercy and goodness. Our role is not to pass the time of this present life unfruitfully and idly after we are baptised or justified, not caring how few good works we do for the glory of God and the profit of our neighbours. Much less is it our role, after we are once made Christ's members, to live contrary to him, making ourselves members of the devil, walking after his enticements and after the suggestions of the world and the flesh, by which we know that we serve the world and the devil and not God. For that faith which brings forth without repentance either evil works or no good works is not a right, pure and living faith, but a dead, devilish, counterfeit and insincere faith, as St Paul and St James call it. For even the devils know and believe that Christ was born of a virgin, that he fasted 40 days and nights without meat and drink, that he worked all kinds of miracles, showing himself to be truly God. They believe also that Christ, for our sakes, suffered a most painful death to redeem us from eternal death, and that he rose again from death on the third day. They believe that he ascended into heaven and that he sits on the right hand of the Father, and at the last end of the world he shall come again to judge both the living and the dead. These articles of our faith the devils believe, and so they believe all things that are written in the New and Old Testament to be true. And yet, for all this faith, they are but devils, remaining still in their damnable state, lacking the very true Christian faith. For the right and true Christian faith is not only to believe that Holy Scripture and all these articles of the faith are true, but also to have a sure trust and confidence in God's merciful promises, to be saved from everlasting damnation by Christ. From this follows a loving heart to obey his commandments. No devil has this true Christian faith, nor does any person who in the outward profession of their mouth and in their outward receiving of the sacraments in coming to church and in all outward appearances seems to be a Christian and yet in their life and works shows the contrary. For how can someone have this true faith, this sure trust and confidence in God that by the merits of Christ their sins are forgiven and be reconciled to the favour of God and be a partaker of the kingdom of heaven by Christ when they live an ungodly life and deny Christ in their deeds? Surely no such ungodly person can have this faith and trust in God. For as they know Christ to be the only saviour of the world, so they know also that the wicked shall not possess the kingdom of God. They know that God hates unrighteousness, that he will destroy all those that speak untruly, that those who have done good works which cannot be done without a lively faith in Christ, shall come forth from the resurrection of life, and that those who have done evil shall come to the resurrection of judgment. They also know very well that to those who are contentious and to those who will not be obedient to the truth but will obey unrighteousness shall come indignation, wrath and affliction and so on. Therefore, to conclude, let us consider the infinite benefits of God shown and given to us mercifully, although we do not deserve them. Let us consider that God has not only created us out of nothing and from a piece of vile clay, but of his infinite goodness has exalted us 
as touching our soul, to his own image and likeness. We were condemned to hell and death eternal, but he has given us his own natural son, being God eternal, immortal and equal to himself in power and glory to be incarnated and to take our mortal nature upon him with the infirmities of it and in the same nature to suffer most shameful and painful death for our offences. He did this to justify us and to restore us to life everlasting, so making us also his dear children, brethren to his only son, our Saviour Christ, and inheritors forever with him of his eternal kingdom of heaven. These great and merciful benefits of God, if they are well considered, neither give us an excuse to be idle and to live without doing any good works, nor yet stir us up by any means to do evil things. On the contrary, if we are not desperate persons and our hearts harder than stone, they move us to give ourselves wholly to God with all our will, hearts, might and power to serve him in all good deeds, obeying his commandments all our lives, to seek in all things his glory and honour, not our sensual pleasures and vain glory, evermore dreading, willingly to offend such a merciful God and loving Redeemer in thought, word or deed. And these benefits of God, deeply considered, move us for his sake, also to be ever ready to give ourselves to our neighbours and as much as in us lies to study with all our endeavour to do good to everyone. These are the fruits of true faith, to do good as much as lies in us to everyone and above all things and in all things to advance the glory of God from whom alone we have our sanctification, justification, salvation and redemption, to whom be glory, praise and honour forever, world without end. Amen.